All right, everybody, we're getting started right now. Good afternoon. My name is Chris Small. We're going to be talking today about uh, some of the IEEE guidelines for resistance grounding. We're going to be going over uh, various IEEE guidelines and focusing on the new stuff from 2020, the differences. Start off about, about me real quick. Chris Small, like I said, been at Post Glover for roughly 12 years, application engineer, regional sales manager, uh, whatever whatever hat I need to wear, typically I do. It's, that's one of the great things about being on a small in a smaller company. I graduated with electrical engineering from Ohio State a while ago. We'll just, we'll just call it a while ago. I am I am I am in mourning about if you guys watch the tournament. I'm in mourning about Friday. I'm I, I'm still in mourning. Um, so I know some, some, some of my counterparts are happy because Michigan's still there, I believe. So, but anyway, so, uh, let's move on to today's topics. We're going to start off with the review. So we typically do that, uh, because there's usually at least a handful, if not more people who don't, who basically need one. If we just talk about a bunch of standards and the changes and you don't really have a good gr a grounding, no pun intended. Uh, of the material, then you may get lost. So we're going to do a review. We're going to kind of roll into IEEE, what they have to say about resistance grounding. And so then we're going to talk about the new guidelines and how it impacts you. So there's going to be a little bit of a, of a review, just to, to warn you, it's, it's, it should be fine. Now, one thing I, I forgot to mention, um, we are going to do question and answer at the end. If you have questions, there is a questions tab. We're going to be taking questions throughout the presentation. We will answer some of them during the presentation via, you know, a, a reply back. But then we're going to do some at the end as well for everybody to like to hear. So don't wait for your question. Go ahead and pop that in the in, in the, the question box. Um, so let's get started with the review. Resistance grounding. Uh, you know, usually we do a comparative analysis uh, because it's important to kind of understand. The differences between a solid ground and ungrounded. We're going to kind of truncate that today. So all resistance grounded is system is is you have a resistor in series between the neutral. This is the neutral point of a four wire system. You're, you know it's called neutral grounding uh, for a reason. There's it needs to be a neutral. So if you have your Y system, you just hook directly off your XO point. Uh, series resistor to ground. Um, it's designed to essentially be the, the, the sole ground path on a ground fault. So if you were to have a ground fault over here, it would be forced to go through the resistor. Now, the, the reason why I, I, we show this over here is because there's a naturally occurring ground path. Uh, we're not going to talk too much about that, but just, just so you know, you're, you're always going to have a capacitive ground path. Um, because of the way that this just the capacitance is kind of inherent in, in, in any electrical system. Um, but the, the majority of your current is going to be flowing here and it's going to be limiting that uh, that current to a low value. Uh, just to, to to kind of close the point on it, essentially for resistance grounding systems, we're trying to get kind of get between an ungrounded system and a solid ground system. Um, what we do is we basically take out the bad stuff, you know, uh, we'll talk about that, some of that stuff here in a second, but uh, of both those types of systems and we keep the good stuff. So I know that's kind of simple, but we'll keep it at that for now. And we'll kind of go over with some of the things that IEEE has to say, some more specifics. There are two different types of resistance grounding, um, high resistance and low resistance. We talked last time about hybrid grounding, which we were hybrid resistance grounding, which we're not going to talk about today, but that's a combination of the two. But anyway, to start off with high resistance ground, it's essentially a resistance grounding system with a, a let through current or the or an available ground fault uh, of 10 amps or less. So that's loosely defined. Uh, it's uh, it's 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 recommended that way. Um, you can do a high resistance ground system uh, higher than 10 amps, um, but that's typically not not the case. Typically, it falls at 10 amps or lower. One of the things it does allow you to do is to continue to operate. 
Um, it's very good for process. This stuff, it's, it's for those of, of you that have been around and, and familiar with it, this has been around for almost 50 years. Maybe, maybe it is 50 years. Uh, early, mid 70s, essentially. Um, but it, it, very good for process, oil and gas, those types of things. Uh, you know, there's been a lot more new uh, applications. We won't go into all those, but that's for a different time. It eliminates a large percentage of your arc flash potential. Um, essentially, it's because the voltage drops. This is for low voltage systems. Uh, the voltage drop across here gets you to a point where you're really below the threshold for for arc arc faults. So. You don't really have a an ability to create an arc faults on line to ground system on line to ground faults. So it doesn't doesn't include your line to line, your three phase faults. But for your line to ground faults, which is roughly 97 to to, to 98 percent of your of your faults overall, it, it eliminates that potential. And then because of it also decreases the potential for shock due to like stray ground currents. So uh so that's high resistance ground low resistance ground is so it's, it looks exactly the same in terms of how it's designed it's just a resistor between neutral and ground that's all it is we're just changing the level of resistance so it, it is what it says it is right low resistance means it's lower compared to high resistance typically speaking where we're talking about lead through current we're looking at 100 amps 200 amps 400 amps those are the typical ranges if you have large transformers generators maybe some some imbalances we've seen stuff in the thousand amp range 1500 amp range it really is it is application dependent but if it gets much higher than that uh, usually there's different alternatives because the cost gets in the way um, but those are kind of where you're looking typically looking at uh, 5 kV 15 kV type type applications um, usually so the advantages of low resistance ground is essentially relay coordination um, equipment equipment protection, and once again, some personnel protection, as relatively speaking, at least. Um, you have uh, for relay coordination, essentially, if you have a solid ground system, you have a lot amount of potential ground fault current that can flow, and you're trying to trip very quickly. I mean, we kind of joke, it's like you, could, you know where your fault is on a solid ground system because you, you can see the smoke. Uh, that's kind of how it works. You try to trip as much as fast as possible, and uh, limit that damage the problem is is that sometimes it's a little too fast uh i've I probably get a couple at least a couple if not more phone calls a year uh, with plants that have a solid ground system they get a ground fault and their main breaker trips and they, they go completely offline at that point they realize that they can't they can't tolerate that type of system and that's when they us usually move to either lower resistance ground or higher resistance ground that's been my experience at least so you get the idea, but really coordination is important. If you have if you have a 400 amps, let's say as an example, you don't have a lot of time to trip, but relatively speaking, you do. For a relay, you have a lot of time to trip. You know, a lot of times it's going to be 400 milliseconds. You know, maybe a little bit less, but if anything over 50 milliseconds really is a long time uh, for especially for for modern relays. Um, so you have a, much more time to trip. Coordinate that coordination is not an issue. Uh, once again, also you're able to go below your da your damage curves potentially, or get to a point where it limits uh, drastically limits the amount of, uh, of of damage you would would you would have. Um, you're still tripping on a ground fault, so there's that. Um, it's it acts similarly to a solid ground in that way. Um, so you must segregate the circuit, uh, and it's usually there's different. There's different uh, time rate ratings, which we'll talk about, but most of the time it's 10 seconds, and we're talking about, like I mentioned, very quick tripping. So that is it for just an overall resistance grounding review. Let's get into IEEE. Um, so for those of you who don't know, I think a lot of you probably are members, but uh, some of you probably aren't, aren't as well. So uh, IEEE stands for Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. It's really you know it's really the standard for in terms of uh guidance for engineering practices on all kinds of a host of topics uh and so it's got a lot of different standards um one thing you may not realize is that i should believe even though they have you know regular employees all the standards are driven by volunteers and they don't they're not they don't have to be i triple members to do that so if you're an, I mean, you typically want to be an engineer, but um, 
if you if you want to be involved in the process, you can be. Uh, and so that's kind of, it's kind of I would call it kind of like Wikipedia for engineers, like a formalized version. You kind of have this community uh, of of you know serious engineers who get together and try to write standards for uh, to make everything safer and and just to kind of give people an idea of how how things should be done. So that's kind of how it is. So with this, if with making that comparison, obviously participation is important. So we'll kind of talk about that in a minute in a little bit as well. So we're going to kind of go over some of the standards that we're familiar with in terms of resistance grounding, just in case you um, you uh, are we're not familiar before we get into the new stuff. Um, so I triple the green book. It's it's uh, this standard 142. It's been around for a while. Uh, but it basically talks about how resistance grounding is going to be able to reduce a bunch of things. In the context of this book, it kind of goes through different types of grounding, just to give you an idea. And so this is kind of countering a lot of the stuff that's already said about solid ground systems. So when we talk about reducing burning and melting effects, that's you know that's in, in the context that, that talks about how solid ground systems actually do that as well. So there's it's it's in contrast to a solid ground system that way. Um, We've kind of talked about some of the some of the, the shock hazards, reduced mechanical stresses, uh, arc blast flash hazard of personnel. Uh, you know, just we're gonna you know just give you an idea of what these things are. Line voltage dip. Uh, the last one is is transient over voltages. So that's really common in an unground system, um, and that's really meant for high resistance ground in terms of avoiding the shutdown of a faulty circuit. So that this overall is meant for resistance grounding. I believe actually in the book itself, it does have uh, high resistance grounding parentheses here. So um, it, that, that was supposed to be just for high resistance ground, but all the other ones are for resistance ground in general. So we are going to stop for a brief moment. Um, I don't know, I wonder how many people, if you remember this, I mean, maybe I'm dating myself or maybe I'm, I'm not sure if I'm, if I'm old or if I'm not old, you can't see it. Oh, well, never mind. My picture goes, I'll let you guys do the poll question. Well, it was one of my favorite games growing up. That's all I'm going to say. So the results of to the first poll question are, were, were you aware of the, today, before today, of the new standard for neutral grounding devices? The overwhelming majority answered no. Not surprising, not expecting you to. Um, just understand that if you're an engineer making specs, I mean, obviously this is why you're here, but we want you, we encourage you guys to use new standards. So hopefully after today, that will be what you do for resistance grounding. All right, so moving on, there was a couple more of these uh, before we get into the new stuff. So the buff book talks uh, talks a lot about high resistance ground and how it has advantages. Obviously, some of these are are redundant in terms of continuity, but uh, you have a pulse system typically to locate a ground fault. So just in case you didn't, didn't know how that worked, you essentially have a ground fault. It's continued to operate. Um, you don't uh, you don't trip. Then you take a large aperture ammeter, zero sequence measurement, typically across all three phases, and uh, you lo you're looking for a pulse, which would indicate the ground fault path. So that's kind of what typically what you would see in a high resistance ground system. Um, one of the things I mentioned is that you know you don't need to necessarily have a uh, quarter uh, study for coordinated ground fault relaying on the ground uh, ground fault relaying. You actually don't even need a ground fault uh, indicator. Uh, for high resistance ground systems. Uh, that is per the NEC, just in case you, did, you knew, didn't know that. Uh, high resistance ground is generally employed. Low voltage where permitted is typically commercial, heavy commercial, uh, industrial, pretty much any industrial application. Honestly, there could be some generation for utilities, et cetera. Um, usually, the, the you know, I guess the biggest caveat is where you aren't servicing line neutral loads. Um, 
just just so you know, if you award a service line on neutral loads per the NEC, it's not it's not allowed because you you basically are or, or you basically uh, bypassing the resistor potentially on a ground fault, so you can't you can't do that. So you basically have to you know isolate with an isolation transformer your line neutral loads. Uh, medium voltage systems where service continuity is desired and capacitive charging current is not excessive. I kind of showed it in that first slide. You kind of have to, there are both types of a ground, of a ground fault path. And so you're going to have current through both of those. The capacitive charging current is typically high impedance. Therefore, you're going to have a low amount of current. But it's very important. You need to, in medium volt systems, you're going to have higher charge currents. So you need to worry about that in terms of seeing if you can, if you can specify high resistance ground. One thing I will mention just, um, you know, you don't really want to worry about you don't really need to worry about most of the time for low low voltage uh, hrgs but you probably do definitely need for medium voltage uh and then uh, retrofits for pre previous on ground systems it, they are very that's this is one of the most common applications in terms of it's easy retrofit on ground systems aren't have their issues uh, which we've talked about previously but potentially over voltage problems with transients and and other others as well and so uh it's a, it's a very common to see, you know, lots of different, you know, oil and gas applications, et cetera, moving with, in this situation to over. It's easy. It's an easy. You don't have any in ground wire, so it's easy to just use your eight gauge wire on the HRG to ground. That's typically what you do. I typically standard two four two. This is the end. This is obviously buff book. The end of end of the buff book. Uh, I did want to just to just in case you were wondering, I did want to to address the idea that look. There is a there's a balance between when you go over standards to just kind of voltize them and listing them out. I tend to try to do the second uh, a little bit. I've done both, but I try to do the second just because I don't want to overwhelm you. But at the same time, um, it is the standard. It's not. I don't. I don't want you to have to trust me. Uh, what 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 they say. I want you to understand what they say. So I am quoting in, in most of what I'm saying here. So um, over voltage are reduced. Uh, you, you you know you typically have to have higher sensitivity relay protection, especially on high resistance ground. Uh, this is not this was an issue maybe 10, 15 years ago. I don't see it being as big of an issue today with the abilities for uh, relaying, et cetera. Um, so it may like like I mentioned before, because of these charge currents, you may have higher amounts uh, of current that you may need for a, a high resistance ground system. One thing I will say is that if you do have higher than 10 amps, you need to be aware of what the type of effects they would have on your system and for how long you, you'd you want to keep that going. Um, I triple E recommends uh, that you keep it below 10 amps when you can, but obviously it also says that you sometimes you have to go above, so it says kind of both things. So just keep that in mind. Uh, usually, it's I, in my, my experience, most of the time it's in data centers where I see the higher charge current, and you just need to kind of deal with that uh, based off of UPS, et cetera. Um, okay. Uh, lastly, we're talking about the Red Book as a review. Uh, it, it actually does mention that there's no arc flash hazard. I already kind of mentioned that already. This It doesn't actually give you a context in that sentence, so you could misunderstand it and say, oh, okay, there's no arc flash hazard for high resistance ground. What it really means is there's no arc flash hazard for ground faults. And so therefore, uh, like I mentioned before, they get that very high level of reduction, but it's definitely not 100%. Um, there, are, there, is a, there is a lot of, uh, there's a, I should say a couple of papers that talk about how you shouldn't attempt uh, 50, uh, high resistance ground on 15 kV systems. They're referring to, um, Continuously operated HRG systems. Uh, we see generate we see HRGs on generators 15 kV all the time for generator protection. Uh, but we've kind of already gone through that on a different uh, different topic, a different time. So we'll leave it at that. Um, okay. And then I've already mentioned this. It should be greater than. So let's get into so the let's get into the history of specifically um, IEEE as it pertains to neutral ground devices. Just quickly, I mean, it started off a long time ago, uh, standard 32 in 1947. Uh, I will say that there's been several updates. You can kind of see the major updates uh, all throughout here. Uh, there's been two major updates. This is was a major update in 1972. 
IEEE kind of took the reins uh, and redid pretty much everything. And these standards were more minimal. And then this one was the second one. So we're going to be talking about, in terms of resistance grounding, we're going to be talking about mostly this one. But the topics we're going to be covering will also cover, you know, kind of cover the changes as well because we'll be sh showing you what, how to do the many of the standards that are in here as well. So we're going to be going over only the resistance grounding portion of it. Uh, the actual the whole the whole standard talks about basically any kind of neutral grounding device. Talk about, talk about reactors, uh, just different 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 styles. Uh, I don't I think it actually gets it doesn't have capacitors in there anymore. I don't believe because they are kind of not used very much anymore in this context. Um, okay, so let's go into uh, the standards. So it talks of 7.22 talks about uh, the different rated times of resistors, uh, 10 seconds, one minute, 10 minutes, extended time or continuous. This is important because, you know, depending on your application, you're going to have uh, different needs and you're going to want to know what kind of different uh, uh, ratings that are available. Uh, continuous is obviously a high resistance ground system which is you need continuous operation that is what that's typically for um and then you have these different these different ratings now the 10 second one i mentioned this but it's it's by far the most popular uh you have you know once again you typically have a four let's say a 400 amp resistor you're not going to want that to be on very long so the 10 second just all that means is essentially you have 10 seconds to trip otherwise your resistor is going to start to overheat and eventually uh you know melt essentially um, but ho hopefully your relays are working and that doesn't happen um, so but you get the idea so it's extended time is, is is much longer um and you shouldn't exceed an average of nine days per year just as a as a, as a note uh, the major thing i want to mention on this uh is that there's hot spot testing replaces average testing for low resistance ground so anything besides so well, I'll show a slide on this and give you a visual in a minute, but basically everything besides uh, high resistance ground will be changing or has changed to a hotspot test. So just that, just to get, so first of all, note here, the reason why we need a hotspot test, you can kind of see here, obviously you can tell visually that this is not uniform in terms of where the heat is coming from. So you have, you know, cooler spots, uh, towards the edges, you have uh, obviously a bunch of heat across the middle, and especially in, in these regions. Obviously, you can tell just by a difference of color where the hot spots are. Um, but uh, and it obviously it depends on the design. You're going to have different hot spots. How, where's the current flowing? How you know how do you, how do you direct it based on the type of metal and the type of shape you're using? So hot spot testing, it's it's, it's intuitive. You put a, a you put a, a testing uh, you know point on the actual hotspot so you, you kind of figure out where the hotspot is and you, you test what that is this is something we've been doing for a very long time but it hasn't been the requirement up until recently for low resistance grounding so you would do an average test and that could be basically something where you would there's different ways to do it but you know just to give you a, an easy visual um you essentially would take the voltage and current measurement uh you could you would cut you would know what the you know based on the the metal that you're using what kind of uh you know resistivity it has or what kind of change in temperature will affect the the resistance and based off of that you can figure out the uh the resistance um so that's going to be more of an average so if I mean, intuitively you can you can tell that the hotspot testing is actually going to be um, is going to make it uh, overall a less hot temperature because if you if you're making sure the hotspot which is the hottest overall is is at a certain level and before you're taking the average you're obviously going to be lower overall overall and if you're lower overall that means you're you're going to be uh, higher in mass it's just physics if you need a lower if you require a lower temperature you're going to be having to carry more mass to create that lower temperature. So therefore, on average, if those guys have used, if, 
in other manufacturers have used an average test before, they're, those are going to probably be uh, larger enclosures now. So let's go over the temperature coefficient of resistance. Uh, this, is an, this is something that was added in 2015. Um, essentially, all it is is the amount, uh, how much does the resistance change as the, the resistor temperature increases? I think it's an important topic. I don't think many people are aware of it. So this is going to be uh, your coefficient. Obviously, you have your two different resistances, but they are. This is going to be your after it gets the maximum rating. This is going to be initial. And then you have your temperature before and after. So this is going to be your, your higher temperature. This is your ambient temperature, et cetera. So that's how you do the, that's how you do the calculation. Um, that was actually important in 2015 because as an engineer you need to know um, what amount of the resistance has has basically lowered so as as the resistor as the resistor heats up the resistance is going to increase and therefore the current's going to drop so it's important to understand how much that drops because if you set your relays the wrong way you might miss out on that because your your current's going to be dropping you might miss out on that relay and that would be catastrophic so you definitely want to know what that is so in 2015, it talks about this is a coefficient of temperature coefficient of resistance. And this is the number that it, that it was landed upon. Now, there has been a change in 2020. The main change, uh, uh, there's a couple of reasons for this change. I think the, the, the main reason, well, there's two reasons. Uh, one of which is that it's just easier for an engineer to understand, well, I have an initial resistance. Um, the manufacturer can't, cannot allow uh, the resistance to change by more than 67%. Now that seems like a shockingly high percentage. I don't disagree with that, but that's that is uh, that is what it is. That's the, the new, so so the first reason is um, that it it, it kind of makes it easier for the end user to understand this, this. This makes a lot more sense just intuitively than what this means. You have to obviously throw this into a, a calculation. The other one is essentially the standards have been loose have been have been loosened a little bit, uh, in my opinion, unfortunately. But it's 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 nothing that can't be overcome. It's not a problem if you know what you, what you're getting into. But uh, that's what happened. So let's give you let's let's talk about a, a, um, comparative analysis in terms of the 215 standard and the 2020 standard. So what I did with the 215 standard is I 2015 standards I basically uh, took the that coefficient of resistance I just showed you, I threw into that formula that I showed you, and I came up with, if, I, if I'm talking about a, a 2400 volt line neutral 4 amp 10 second resistor, which has a 760 degree C rise, uh, uh, you know, standard, then you're going to be getting 333 amps. So you're going to have a voltage, you always had a current drop, and before then you, 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 you obviously had a current drop. There wasn't much of a standard before 2015 in terms of how much it could drop. Um, but so that's what you're getting in 2015. And now obviously it's 67%, it's much easier calculation, but you're getting uh, a lower value. So um, one, one thing to note, there was a recommendation for neutral monitoring of resistance. Uh, it was removed. I am not advocating the idea that it was removed because it's not, it's not, uh, it's not uh, beneficial. It definitely can be, I'll give you one, really good example if you have a generator and you want to start that generator up it would be a, an advantage to you to know if you are ungrounded when you start that generator up uh, almost always are not going to be but if you have a neutral monitor there you're going to know for sure that you so that's one one example that being said it's really application dependent um, it depends on how much you how much is going to benefit you depending on so it, so it wasn't really necessary to put it in a standard in, in, in the in the panel's opinion so I just want to make a note of that let's move on to poll question number two At some point, I may come up with better ideas on coin pictures to put on these poll questions, but I haven't run out of them yet. So, okay. 
And the results this time are a little more even, slightly more on the yes side that people were aware from the, of the drastic change in resistance um, as the resistor warms up. That's good to hear. Oh yeah, it's not, I think to some people it's gonna be alarming and some people they already know about it. It's, it's, it's inherent that's gonna happen, but to what degree it happens can be controlled obviously by the material that you use. So it's kind of a balance between uh, cost effectiveness um, and also just having the you know convenience essentially for the customer to be able to set the relays accordingly. Okay, so next we're gonna go into testing. Uh, how we test, what the differences are. This is from uh, the an amendment. So I'm just basically showing you the changes between 2020 and 2015. There's always been a resistance measurement. So that was in both of those. That makes sense. Obviously, it's a pretty important to measure a res the resistance of a resistor to make sure that it's accurate. Uh, that's all. So, so just these different categories, just, just in case you're unaware, routine is basically a a standard test that you'd have per unit. So if you had a, if you bought a unit from us, we would do a, a you know, test report and this would be part of the test report, anything on this, this row. Design, uh, I think is intuitive in the sense that you're gonna do basically a type test where you uh, test the design, make sure it works. And then after that, everything that's that same thing, is gonna be fine. And then really you have the other category, which is, you know, obviously other, the only one that really falls into that one at this point is a seismic verification. Uh, you know, we there is separate testing. You can do shake table, uh, which is what this is referring to. Uh, but you would you need to be in a seismic zone. You would have that kind of that, that on your spec. So that's a completely separate uh, test report, essentially certification. So anyway, so we got rid of the impedance measurement. Essentially, it wasn't really needed. I mean, you're already doing a resistance test on here. Um, to be honest, in practice, it wasn't done very often anyway. Uh, so they just, they remove this. I don't, it's not, it's a little bit redundant here. Um, change the apply voltage test a little bit. It doesn't really impact uh, you guys. The lighting impulse test is gotten rid of. You don't, you don't, you didn't really have it very often anyway. You had a higher voltages. Uh, uh, so it's typically a destructive test. You don't necessarily want to have that. You don't necessarily need it either. So it, it was removed. Uh, temperature rise test, I kind of mentioned before, some differences. You have a, uh, so for stay sake, HRGs, you have a uh, three to five degree C rise. Uh, and that's always been, or at least as long as I know, have, have known about it, it's been uh, hotspot testing. Um, and so I kind of, kind of intuitively understand what that means. Just measure the hotspot, make sure that you, you don't have more than that kind of rise. Well, like I mentioned before, these have all changed to from an average to a hotspot. Could increase the size of your enclosure. Be aware. Usually, your 10-second resistors, or I should say, based on this chart, anything less than 10 seconds, 10 minutes, excuse me, it's a 760-degree C rise. Um, and then you get into your 610s if you're in this in this range. So just to give you an idea of what the temperatures are, and that is the change from ambient. So if you whatever your ambient is, you're going to add that number, and that's what you're going to have. This the, the change. Okay, another part of the change in standard is the addition of the altitude and dielectric strength. Um, this is something that's been around in terms of the idea and uh, the practice, but uh, it's, it wasn't new to the standard. Um, essentially, the idea is as you increase in altitude, you're going to have to derate your resistor. And so that means that your clearances are going to get larger your spacing is going to be larger, your enclosure potentially, not necessarily, but potentially could be larger because of that. So if you, you know, if you, if you tip, you're used to using a four foot cube resistor and, you know, just happens to be on a, on a mountain somewhere where you have, let's say 6,000, 7,000 feet, you, in the back of your mind, you maybe, maybe want to look that up because you may be looking at a larger enclosure because of that derating. Just to give you an idea, uh, most manufacturers they have different resistor sizes you know so uh you know for example if you had a bunch of stuff let's say you had a current transformer in here you had a sensor resistor in here um and you had to derate this unit which means you would need an extra inch of space in the enclosure well manufacturers typically don't just make custom enclosures every time they they 
uh, they make a resistor, uh, it would be very expensive. So there's different sizes. So, you know, as an example, you may have, you may be bumped up to a much larger size of four foot, a four foot cube, um, which, or, you know, if you're looking at the, the hood, it's gonna be a little bit larger than that. But in the same thing can be said for four foot cube, you might be going up to the next larger in size. Uh, depending on what the manufacturer has just to give you a visual uh, what you may be looking at at thousand feet six thousand feet just there's a lot of variables so i can't say oh this is what you'll be seeing at six thousand feet this is what it's not it doesn't it doesn't really work that way there's so many variables but uh it's it's going to be moving that way just so you know we move on to nameplates uh the i highlight the differences just to give you an example of what one looks like uh this is one of this is a nameplate we made uh a couple months ago um, but so ju just to go over the changes, but you, typically you would have to just put the initial current, which, you know, let's say 4 amp resistor, which, you know, uh, is going to be at your uh, starting point, what you're starting off on the fault. But uh, now you're required to rate the current at the, at the, at the rate of time. So, that, so this, for example, this is a 10 second. What are the, what are the answers going to be after, after 10 seconds? Well, it's going to be 243. So you see the difference. It's a, you know, it's kind of it's comparable to what you saw before. Um, and so one thing you need to note if you have multiple ratings, you're gonna you need to put them both on the nameplate. A uh, good example of this, a lot, a lot of larger uh, transformers slash generators, they may have more of an, more imbalance. Uh, so we typically see these very large applications where there's very large transformers and and they decide to use resistance grounding they're going to typically be in a higher level of current because of this because of the imbalances etc there's different reasons but that's definitely one of them that's the main one um so that being said they typically want to have let's say a four four amp ten second rating but they also need need to carry a continuous rating as well there have there have been some papers that suggest that um that 10 percent of your 10 second resistor would be basically a continuous rating I don't want to say that's incorrect, but I would not count on that. Uh, I would ask for a continuous rating if you need one. Anything, in my opinion, anything over 10 amps, uh, you, I would ask for uh, a continuous rating as well as a 10 second rating on a resistor. They would do like basically a temperature curve and figure out what that means. You're going to have a larger resistor essentially, but it's, it's worth it. You, you won't have to worry about, uh, you know, continue, continuously, you're going to burn out pretty quickly uh, if you have, you know, if you're over, overcurrenting continuously uh, on a resistor you know after a few days it's probably it could be lights out there um line and line voltage you know it just it's a, it's pretty pretty straightforward but there's been several times where i work we deal with this weekly where we customer goes to the voltage customer looks at a voltage okay well is that line and line line and neutral the resistor lives line and neutral so a lot of times it's people you know transformer guys are line to line so you know they're talking you know it's always it's pretty obvious it's you know but it's just better to have it that way there's a voice confusion i can't tell you how much time we've spent on trying to find out whether voltage was line neutral line to line uh the weight is added as well then the year of standard and the altitude so those are the new nameplate changes uh it's obviously for the temperature coefficient this is good this is good information for you guys to have set your relays this this rated time uh current because that way you don't have to worry about um you don't have to worry about the you know setting that incorrectly uh just so that's my first point make sure whoever said the relay uh, how does this impact you make sure whoever is setting the relay uh understands the impacts of the temperature rise i know that a lot of you say you know and that's great some people don't this and i think it's misapplied sometimes so we need to make sure we that they understand that i mean the good news is that you know a lot of times the relay is going to see it before it drops below even if you didn't set it correctly however i wouldn't obviously not want to game on that one um make sure you don't discount the impact higher altitudes can have on resistor sizing that's that's for really for the 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 higher altitudes and the testing you really want to have uh standardized testing because um you want to make sure you're getting the right thing uh i'd rather have 
a resistor that is tested that I know is not going to go over the rate of current than not. So in that vein, you should probably specify the new standard because that's what most people are using, if not all. Uh, so um, I would specify that so that everybody's on the same playing field and so you know what you're getting. That's um, the gist there. So that's about it. In conclusion, um, just understand that you should want to design your specifications around what is best for you and your client. These standards are great, and I think they're very good to go off of. This, they're not a um, they're not a, a replacement for design. Obviously, you need to figure out what your design is, what your goals are, and design based on that. I wouldn't be leaning too heavily on you can you can rely on these types of specifications and uh, and uh, for you know conformity of quality or you know testing procedures etc. Um, but just uh, it's just kind of a disclaimer. Don't make make sure you're you're designing your own system based on what you need. Um, low resistance grounding. There may be a reason for disparity in size price. This happens all the time. Uh, I, I would I'd say it's beneficial to be a little bit cynical. I know there's a lot of, not to pick on contractors, but there's a lot of contractors who's looking for the lowest price, the lowest size. That makes sense. They're assuming it, make, it meets a spec. Um, but I would just always ask questions. Physics is physics. And you, if, if, you're, if you have a resistor that's half as big as the other one, half, is, half the cost, there's a reason for it. It's not because one's a master resistor maker, the other one's not, generally speaking. So just, just saying. Uh, keep up to date with, with IEEE recommendations. Uh, you know, it's always good to do that. I know resistors, are, you know, they're not high on the list for a lot of engineers. They're, they're power engineers are looking at the big stuff like transformers and switch gear. And I don't blame you for that. But it's good to keep up with the recommendations, make sure that uh, this, your specs uh, are reflecting that. Then get involved with IEEE committees. Um, just to, to bring it up, I didn't mention it, but basically, you know, this, this standard went down a little bit in terms of the, the temperature of coefficient, the temperature of resistive coefficient. Uh, does that benefit customers? It doesn't necessarily hurt customers, but it is more convenient for, you know, I guess you you can make the argument it's it's it's, it's better for uh, commercial purposes. It may, be, it may give you more choices in terms of cheaper resistors, et cetera. Um, but in terms of, you know, being able to uh, rely on the resistance and what it is. I I, I just say it's it's nicer to have it tighter. The point is is that the more people are involved with with committees in general and doing standards in general, just like this whole Wikipedia idea, the more it's going to be it's it's going to be influenced by a balanced audience. Uh, just as an example, if you have all manufacturers in the on the committee, you're probably going to get uh, leaning that way a little bit. And not that they're not going to be safe, but they may be doing what's in their best interest in terms of uh, uh, convenience, et cetera, cost, whatever. So anyway, that is it. Uh, hopefully you learned something. Uh, if you have any questions, please email me. Uh, we are going to be going through questions right now. If you've, uh, if you, uh, if you've listed any in the, Q in, the, in the question box, you will receive an email certificate with a participation certificate and a link to the video. Uh, if you did not attend, obviously you're not here, but they're also going to get the video. Uh, we can, if you request a PDF version, we can give you that as well. Uh, there are 50 states with 50 different uh, P boards. They all have different requirements for, uh, for you know, for, for audits, etc. In terms of your PE credits or your continu continuing education credits, if we don't meet your needs in terms of your certificate. Please contact us. I believe I haven't really came across one yet, maybe a couple that uh, that have had issues, but I think you'll probably be fine. But just in case, give us a call. We're happy to help you. So now we're going to move to questions. Stu, please. Uh, not as many questions this time. The first one that came up with uh, was with respect to NEC 70. And the articles that um, deal with surge protection systems. Um, the gentleman wanted to know if I have an impedance grounded system, do I have to forego any surge protection? Well, no. So you're 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 going to be 
Uh, I'm trying to think about understanding the question. Uh, so you 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 want to have surge protection. Uh, you cannot. You're not supposed to have surge protection on the neutral. Not supposed to be able to interrupt the the, the ground path essentially. So that's one thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, I'm trying to think. What about the use of say surge arresters? Well, I mean, that's going to that's going to increase your capacity on your system. So you, depending on what that looks like, for example, if it's a high resistance ground system, that may that may be a problem in terms of the capacitive charge current. So you may not be able to use it that way. Um, but yeah, I mean, any suggestions on say a connection scheme for surge arresters? Should I connect them based to ground? <laughs> thanks for them? thanks for leading me, Stu. All right, so I finally. Yeah, so basically because of that, just to follow up with what I just said, um, you know, if you hook them up delta, then you don't have to worry about the capacitive charge current there. So, um, so yeah, so that way, if you, that, that's definitely an option for you. If, if you didn't want it to, if you wanted to keep your search arresters, you would just hook them up delta instead of y. That way you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have that additional capacitance uh, attached to the, to the uh, system ground. Uh, another person in Indiana, the question uh if i were to use a 400 amp 10 second resistor would it always go all the way down to 240 amps when there's a ground fault uh no well no because just because i mean if it, if they test consistently then technically if you waited 10 seconds it would get it would get down to the rate of resistance or the, the temperature or excuse me the current I'll get it right eventually the hat that being said it's, there's going to be a, a, a wide vari variance in how long you're going to be staying online. Probably going to be very short, very, very short, which means you're probably going to be much less than that, much, much less, or much more, I should say, much closer to the original. Um, so the answer is no, but just depends on how long you let the resistor uh, have a fault in there. That was probably the bulk or, or the two biggest questions of, of relevance to this. Um, Obviously, if you have any other questions for Chris, please feel free to submit them. Um, and, and we'll make sure he gets around to answering each and every one of you. All right, guys, really do appreciate it. Uh, we will be getting back to you in the near future with uh, our next webinar series. But uh, until then, thanks for thanks for, for coming. And uh, hopefully you guys have a good, good time. Uh, uh, and, and we want you back next month or the following month. Uh, take care, guys.